He signed his name many different ways in his lifetime, as Colombo, Colomo, Colom, and Cologne. But his favorite, and the one he used most after his adventures at sea had brought him fame, was Christophe Colon. It would have surprised him to know that he would go down in history as Christopher Columbus. It would have surprised him even more to know that the world would remember him as the man who discovered the new continent of the Americas. For he believed until his death that his greatest achievement had been in finding a new route to Asia and to the abundant islands of the Indies. He never fully understood that in this mission he had failed. What wouldn't have surprised Christopher Columbus was that he gained enduring fame and honor. This was his quest from the beginning, and a fate he felt he richly deserved. Sometime after his first triumphant voyage across the Atlantic, Columbus was the guest of honor at an elegant banquet hosted by the Grand Cardinal of Spain. There were always people who were jealous of the explorer, and one of them happened to be at dinner that night. The belligerent fellow asked Columbus, isn't it true that if you hadn't found the new world that someone else would have come along and done it? Columbus didn't answer. Instead, he picked up an egg and invited everyone at the table to try and balance it on one end. Everyone tried, and everyone failed. Then Columbus took the egg, smashed one end flat, and stood it up on the flattened end. His message was clear. Others would now know how, but he, Christopher Columbus, had shown the way. His pride and his persistent demands for reward and recognition aside, Christopher Columbus did show the way. Although there is plenty of evidence to support the claim that Vikings reached the New World around the year 1000 and settled for a time on the coast of North America, their contact didn't last. In the 1400s, when Columbus was born, Europeans knew nothing of the Viking discovery, and people of Europe and the people of the Americas were unaware of each other's existence. Columbus was the first to establish a permanent European settlement in the New World, and it was his voyage that led to an enduring link between the Eastern and Western Hemispheres. Before him, there were two different worlds on Earth. After him, there was one. Christopher Columbus was born in the fall of the year 1451 in Genoa, Italy. At the time, Europe was struggling against the growing threat of the Ottoman Empire, which had spread to much of southeastern Europe. When Columbus was two years old, the Ottomans took control of Constantinople, which we know today as Istanbul, Turkey. Ottoman control of the area presented a crisis to Europeans because Constantinople was the trade center between Europe and Asia. Suddenly, Europeans had no access to the merchandise and wealth of what they called the Indies, the area of India, China, the East Indies, and Japan. This was serious. In the Indies was a vast supply of gold, silk, gems, and spices, the luxuries of European life, and the stuff that had made many traders wealthy overnight. The spices, such as cloves, nutmeg, and mace, came from an area Europeans then called the Spice Islands, now part of Indonesia. They were an essential part of 15th century life, not just for flavoring foods, but as medicines. It was inconceivable to Europeans that they would lose access to these valuable products, so instead they would have to create their own access. This crisis is what ushered in the magnificent age of exploration. Europeans, cut off from a land route to Asia, were forced to find sea routes, and in so doing, they would discover new territories and continents both east and west. At first, Europeans went east and found routes by going south around the tip of Africa and east across the Indian Ocean. But soon they began to think about heading west across the Atlantic. It's not true that in Christopher Columbus' day, all people believed the world was flat. Many had come to suspect and even believe it was round. There were a handful of sailors and explorers who were convinced they could eventually reach the east by sailing west, although no one had yet proven it. Christopher Columbus believed it was his God-given destiny to be the first. Little is known of Columbus' early life except that Genoa remained his home until he was about 25. His father was a woolen weaver and his mother was the daughter of a weaver. Christopher and his brothers, Bartholomew and Diego, were trained as apprentices, 
and it was their resourcefulness that often saved their neglectful father from ruin. Genoa was a seaport, and almost every boy learned how to sail. Columbus was piloting his own little boat when he was 14, and later made at least two longer voyages, one to an island in the Aegean, and another across the Mediterranean to Africa. He worked as a common sailor, although he would later claim he was captain. As a young man, as throughout his life, he was known for what his friends called his little exaggerations. When he was 25, Columbus sailed from Genoa with a fleet of five caravels, a sturdy ship the Portuguese had invented that was known for its ability to sail against the wind. The fleet was carrying merchandise to be sold up north along the Atlantic coast of Europe. But as the ships cleared the Straits of Gibraltar, 13 French and Portuguese men-of-war ships opened fire on them. Columbus was wounded and his ship went down. He leapt into the sea and grabbed onto an oar for support. By pushing it ahead of him and sometimes stopping to rest on it, he managed to swim six miles to the shore of Portugal. He'd been brought to the land where he would develop the skills that would make him one of the most outstanding navigators of his time. Columbus was nursed back to health by the Portuguese, and when he was better, he headed right for Lisbon, the world's greatest seaport. For many years, the Portuguese had been the most powerful and adventurous seafarers, forging into the unknown territories of the South Atlantic, establishing towns along the coasts of Africa, and discovering new islands in its adjoining seas. Columbus was now 27. He was almost completely illiterate, but this didn't stop him from pursuing the education he so desperately wanted and needed. In Lisbon, he learned mathematics, astronomy, navigation, and Spanish and Portuguese. He studied geography as best it could be studied in the early 15th century. That meant primarily that he studied the works of Ptolemy, an Egyptian geographer who lived during the 100s A.D. Ptolemy's map showed that most of the world was covered by land, from his studies, Columbus began to formulate a plan. The plan to sail west to the Indies was based on two miscalculations from the start. First of all, Columbus underestimated the size of the world by about 25%. He, like most people, thought it consisted only of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Secondly, Columbus believed that most of the world was land rather than water. Therefore, he thought Asia extended much farther east than it did, and that the waters separating Asia and Europe, heading west, weren't particularly large. The distance from Spain to Asia was really 12,000 miles. Columbus thought it was 3,000 miles. They were logical conclusions, given what he had to work with, but they were conclusions that would cause him great disappointment and confusion over the next 20 years. Columbus' brother, Bartholomew, joined him in Lisbon, and they opened a map-making shop. Columbus joined one caravel on an expedition that led to Iceland, and he later commanded a ship involved in sugar trade, from which he made a substantial profit. By now he was an experienced seaman and an expert map-maker, even though the maps of his time were severely limited. A devout Christian, Columbus often attended Mass in the chapel of a private girls' school in Lisbon. One day he met an aristocratic young woman there named Felipa Perestreo Moniz, whose father was the first governor of an island the Portuguese had discovered off northern Africa, in the Madeira group. Things happened rather quickly after that. Columbus and Felipe were married. They moved to the Madeiras, where Columbus opened a general merchandise store, and the following year they had a son named Diego. From the Madeiras, Columbus set out on voyages to the Canary Islands, the Azores, islands in the Atlantic coast west of Africa. He also sailed to trading posts on the western African coast, where he saw much of the trade in gold and slaves. And he may even have sailed to England and Ireland. Within two years, Felipe died and Columbus moved back to Portugal. In the mid-1480s, when Columbus was in his thirties, he finally resolved to try out his plan for sailing west to the Indies, a plan he called Enterprise of the Indies. He had the training and skills he needed, he felt he had the knowledge, he had the contacts that would be useful, and certainly he had the courage and initiative. Now all he needed was financial backing, and that could only come from a king. The first logical king to try was the king of Portugal, his adopted country, 
and the country that led the world in exploration. The King of Portugal took Columbus' plan and turned it over to a commission of astronomers, mariners, and pilots. They rejected it. Columbus was not the least discouraged. He packed up his plans and headed for the court of Spain, where he might find a more willing audience in King Ferdinand. King Ferdinand was a slightly more willing audience, but not much. He was afraid such a voyage would get him into conflict with Portugal, and furthermore, he didn't think Spain could afford the immense expenses of such a trip. But Ferdinand had a queen, and Queen Isabella, who was about the same age as Columbus, and always had a soft spot for men with courage and resolve, thought the plan should be given a chance. She insisted that it be submitted to a commission of experts. So once again, Columbus' plan was sent off to a committee, and once again, he waited. This time he waited two years. When the committee finally made its decision, the decision was no. It felt Columbus' estimates were incorrect. It favored the belief that the world was larger than Columbus thought, and made up more of water than land. In addition, it found Columbus' demands outrageous. He wanted to be made a titled aristocrat. He wanted to rule over all the lands he discovered, and to pass that rulership on to his sons and he wanted a sizable percentage of the wealth he brought back to Spain. Finally, the Spanish were concerned with other, more important matters. The Moors had occupied the province of Granada, and Spain would need all its financial resources to wage war and chase them out. Columbus was told to come back and try again when the war was over. It would be over six years between the time Columbus first proposed his voyage and the time Spain conquered Granada. But in those six years, Columbus refused to let his dream die. He sent his brother Bartholomew to try the King of England, Henry VII. Henry, too, consulted his experts, but they called the plan a joke. Next, Bartholomew tried King Charles VIII of France. He, too, found the plan unsensible and expensive. During all these rejections and frustrations, Columbus at least had the comfort and support of a lover and a family. He had fallen in love with a Spanish peasant woman named Beatriz Enriquez de Jarana, and they now had a son, Columbus II, named Ferdinand. Columbus never married Beatriz, even though he seemed very devoted to her. Most likely her low social standing stood in the way. Columbus could never have expected respect or favors from any European king if he was married to a peasant. While he waited, Columbus also continued to read and study. He drew extensive maps, and he pored over the Bible, looking for clues as to the design of the globe. Perhaps his favorite book was The Travels of Marco Polo, which he always carried with him on his voyages. Marco Polo had traveled to Asia overland 200 years before, and had returned with glorious reports of the riches of Kublai Khan and his empire. Columbus was filled with visions of rulers adorned in pearls and emeralds, of palaces shimmering with gold, and of women draped in the finest silks. It was the vision he thought awaited at the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Finally, in 1492, when he was 41 years old, his vision seemed within grasp. The Moors surrendered to Spain, and the king was free to finance the pursuits of peace. Even though their commission had advised against it, Ferdinand and Isabella had been persuaded by others at court to take a chance on Columbus. So, in April, they signed the deeds that would give Columbus the ships, supplies, and men he would need to voyage across the Atlantic. In the ten-year period between 1492 and 1502, Christopher Columbus would make four voyages for Spain. On each voyage, he would chart new waters and discover new lands. But it's that first voyage, in 1492, that would be remembered by history and celebrated for centuries thereafter. Columbus, now an admiral, set out on August 3rd from a small port in southwestern Spain called Palos. In Palos, he'd been provided with help from two experienced sailing families, the Pinzons and the Niños, who selected the ships and the crew members. Martin Alonso Pinzon was captain of the Pinta, and his brother Vincente Pinzon captain the Niña. Columbus captained the Santa Maria, the largest of the three ships. All three of the now-famous ships were made of wood, had no engines or motors, and no luxuries of any kind. 
There were 90 men sailing on the three ships, including officers and sailors, a translator, three doctors, servants for each captain, a secretary, and an accountant. The cooks used portable wood-burning stoves and concocted meals made mostly of salted meat or fish, hard biscuits, and thin wine. There were no bunks except for the officers. The crew slept on deck in good weather, huddled below in bad. During the day they were busy handling the sails and ropes, pumping out water, and doing cleaning and repair work. The little fleet made a brief stop at the Canary Islands to load provisions, then headed south, where it could pick up the trade winds. Then it veered west. It was this decision to travel the latitudes where the winds were behind them that had much to do with Columbus' success. In recent years, a few other sailors had ventured forth into these unknown waters, but they traveled only short distances. Columbus was different. He was a superb navigator who made up for his few crude instruments with a keen sense of observation and an understanding of the sea. His instruments were only a simple quadrant that didn't work when the ship was rolling, a compass, and a half-hour glass to measure time. To measure latitude, he used the North Star. Distances and speed he could only guess at. With only those tools and his wit at his service, he sailed forth under sunny, calm skies. For a month all was well, and then the crew began to get anxious. Surely by now they should have seen the islands Columbus promised. There were grumblings and complaints on the deck. But the three little ships moved forward. Then in October, two months into the voyage, the grumblings became louder. According to calculations, they should have reached Japan by now. Instead, there was only this vast ocean, seemingly without end. There was a small mutiny, nothing violent, but enough to worry the captains. The crew confronted Columbus and said it wanted to turn back for home. This ocean was leading nowhere, and they were starting to get fearful. Columbus insisted they go on, and with the help of the Pinzon brothers, he was able to restore order. Only a day after this mild rebellion, the first signs of land began to appear coastal seaweed floating on the water, and birds flying overhead. Finally, on the pre-dawn morning of October 12th, a sailor on the Pinta let out the call they'd all been waiting for. Tierra! Tierra! Land! Land! The king and queen had offered a large reward to the first man who spotted land, so the sailor was even more excited by his welcome discovery. But Columbus, anxious to reap the reward himself, soon began claiming that he had seen lights on the land hours before the sailor, but had kept quiet until he was sure. What this land was will forever remain a matter of dispute. Shortly before noon, the three ships pulled into an island in the Caribbean Sea, in what is now called the West Indies. The inhabitants of the island called it Guamahani. Columbus renamed it San Salvador. Most scholars think the island was the Watling Island in the Bahamas so it was officially renamed San Salvador in 1926. But there are at least three other islands that could have been the actual landing site. Whatever the island was, Columbus was sure he had arrived at the East Indies, near Japan or China. Because of that, he called the islanders Indians, a name that explorers and conquerors used from then on to describe the natives of the New World. It would be 30 years before the world would realize that Columbus had been wrong. The island Columbus found had neither golden palaces nor emperors nor pearls. Instead, it had a gentle group of people who made cotton, lived in villages, and had a well-developed social system. But because they were only partially clothed, Columbus described them as primitive and uncivilized. When he saw there was nothing of value on the island to take home, he dragged off some Indians instead. It was the first of many times he would abuse the people of the islands he discovered, as would most of the explorers who followed him. The ships moved on to another island, and then found their way to Cuba. Columbus was convinced they had found the Asian mainland, and sent a delegation to seek the court of the Mongol emperor. There was no emperor. But the inhabitants of Cuba told Columbus of an island nearby that was said to be rich with gold, and so he immediately set off in that direction, only to be driven back by a storm. In the confusion, the Pinta sailed off on its own, with Martin Pinzon in command. Pinzon and Columbus had been at odds from the start. 
Pinzon believed that he was the superior navigator of the two, and was already planning to try and take credit for the voyage when they returned to Spain. If he reached the gold first, so much the better. Columbus sailed on without him and discovered Haiti, which he called Hispaniola. But on Christmas Eve, exhausted and desperate for rest, Columbus turned the helm of the Santa Maria over to a sailor who then passed it on to an unskilled cabin boy. The ship crashed on a reef, and unable to save it, Columbus moved his quarters to the Nina. Now the admiral had a problem. The Nina was too small to carry the forty men and boys who'd been traveling on the Santa Maria and the Pinta still hadn't returned. What was he to do with the extra men? Columbus never intended to start any colonies on his voyage, but that changed in a minute when he realized he was being held back by surplus crew. He left them behind to start a settlement on the shores of Hispaniola, which he called La Navidad, in honor of Christmas. Then he headed out to sea again. At first Columbus intended to resume his search for gold, but then he began to worry about Martin Pinzon and the Pinta. What if the Pinta was headed for Spain? And what if Pinzon got to the king and queen before he did? He decided to head for home instead. When the Nini was only about a week out to sea, it sighted the Pinta, and Columbus waved to Pinzon to come on board. Pinzon told Columbus he had no choice but to leave the fleet because the winds of the storm had disabled his ship. Columbus didn't believe a word of it, but decided to pretend he did. The two set out for Spain side by side once again. The voyage home was rough and dangerous. Thunder and lightning storms descended, and many of the island inhabitants on board became ill and died. The Nina and Pinta became separated again, and as Columbus approached Europe, he was driven by winds into the port of Lisbon. Pinzon, at the helm of the Pinta, had reached Spain first, just as Columbus feared. But when he rushed to the king and queen filled with stories of his own glory, they refused to see him. They would wait, they said, until Columbus arrived. Martin Pinzon, humiliated and bitterly disappointed, walked to his house in the Spanish countryside and took to his bed. He died there shortly after. Columbus arrived only two days after Pinzon and reported to Ferdinand and Isabella in Barcelona, where he was given a magnificent welcome. He had little to show for his voyage, only a few trinkets and a handful of natives who had managed to survive the harsh trip home. But he claimed he had reached islands just off the coast of Asia. The king and queen were delighted to know there were new lands to claim, and they were equally delighted to hear about the hundreds of natives which Columbus said were so gentle and docile they could easily be rounded up for the slave trade. They immediately granted Columbus permission for a second voyage to find even more new lands, and to establish Spanish colonies in the ones he'd already found. During his audience with the king and queen, Columbus was given the right to display a castle and a lion on his arms the royal symbols. Privileges and honors of all kinds were heaped upon him, including monetary rewards. Nevertheless, he insisted on being awarded the prize money promised to the first man who spotted land. The sailor, who in fact deserved that honor, was so disappointed he emigrated from Spain to Morocco. That same year, on September 1493, Christopher Columbus set sail once again across the Atlantic. This voyage was very different from his first tentative trip. He now had 17 ships under his command, and a crew of almost 1,500 men, many of whom hoped to settle in the islands, get rich quickly, and return to Spain. There were also the inevitable priests aboard, who were determined to convert the Indians to Christianity. It was the largest non-military armada to ever leave Spain. The second voyage of Columbus lasted almost three years. In that time, he discovered the present-day French West Indies, the islands of St. Kitts, Marie Galante, the Leeward Islands, and the Virgin Islands. He also landed for a time at Puerto Rico, the only part of the future United States that he visited. It was a voyage without trouble or serious obstacle, until he returned to Hispaniola. In Hispaniola, Columbus looked in vain for the forty men he'd left behind on his first voyage. Where there was a settlement, there were now only ashes. Where there had been Spaniards, there were now only natives. There were two stories about what happened to the men, and both were probably right. The first is that the men fought among themselves over the local women. 
The second is that the Spaniards badly mistreated natives who responded by killing them and setting their buildings on fire. Columbus was angry and disappointed, but he was calm enough to order his men to search for any gold the dead settlers might have buried. He moved further east and started a new colony, which he called Isabella. Then, realizing his location had been chosen in haste, he established one on a better harbor to the south, which he named Santa Domingo, in honor of his father, Domenico. When several attempts to find gold failed, Columbus jammed four caravels full of slaves and sent them off to Spain instead. Men, women, children, and infants were thrown into dark, damp holes infested with vermin and shipped thousands of miles from the only home they'd ever known. It was in these new settlements on the islands of Hispaniola that the luck of Christopher Columbus began to run out. The colonists were dissatisfied and resentful. None of the riches Columbus promised had materialized. Instead, they'd been put to work like common laborers. The men complained about their diet of corn, fish, and yams, and many of the men were coming down with tropical fevers. Worst of all, none of them liked taking orders from a genuine. There were so many mutinies and rebellions that an official was sent from Spain to investigate Columbus' policies. Meanwhile, Columbus went off to explore the coast of Cuba, which he was still convinced was the Asian mainland. He forced his crew to sign affidavits, saying they agreed with him, at threat of having their tongues cut off. The natives of Hispaniola were suffering as much as the Spaniards. They were beginning to die from infectious diseases brought over by the Europeans, and Columbus had forced many of them into slavery. Every male over fourteen had to pan the rivers for gold, and if they didn't collect their quotas, sometimes their hands were chopped off. It seemed the destruction of his first settlement of fellow sailors had hardened Columbus, ever since he had become cruel, unforgiving, and bitter, traits he never demonstrated before. When the official from Spain arrived and filed a critical report, Columbus hastened back to Spain to explain himself to his king and queen. At first he was coolly received. He had failed to find the rich Asian mainland, and his settlers were unruly in complaining about his policies. But Columbus was so powerful a speaker and so charming a presence that he won them over. They authorized yet another crossing of the Atlantic, and Columbus set out once again in 1498 at the age of 47. But this time he had trouble organizing a crew. Men had heard that the islands had proved unprofitable. Columbus' reputation had sunk so low that his children were jeered by other boys who yelled, There go the sons of the Admiral of the Mosquitoes! Meanwhile, hordes of aspiring explorers and discoverers were taking to the seas, heading for Columbus Islands, and making claims to lands he felt rightly should be his. Columbus remarked bitterly at the time, they all made fun of my plan then. Now even tailors wish to discover. On this third voyage, Columbus discovered the island of Trinidad and then crossed over to the coast of Venezuela. There he noticed an enormous flow of fresh water from the Orinoco River that indicated the new land wasn't an island. He wrote in his log, I believe that this is a very great continent, which until today has been unknown. But even though he recognized he had discovered a continent, Columbus still believed he was in the East Indies and that Japan and China must surely be near. Because he believed that, instead of being named after him, the American continents were later named after Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian explorer. Columbus couldn't linger in South America. He was viceroy of the new colonies he'd founded, and he was carrying provisions for them. He steered towards Hispaniola again and towards his greatest disgrace. Hispaniola was in a state of discontent and rebellion when Columbus arrived. First, Columbus tried to appease the settlers by letting them enslave the Indians to work their land. But there were power struggles among the settlers and continued dissatisfaction at the lack of wealth in Hispaniola. When a commissioner named Francisco de Bobadilla arrived from Spain to investigate the trouble, he was shocked to see several Spanish rebels swinging from the gallows and many more confined to a pit, awaiting the same fate. Bobadilla arrested Columbus, put him in chains, and shipped him back to Spain. The captain of the ship Columbus traveled on offered to remove the chains, but Columbus refused, saying he would only allow them to be removed by royal command. 
In Spain, the sight of Columbus in chains was distressing to Ferdinand and Isabella. He was still their admiral, and he discovered new lands for the crown. They forgave Columbus and granted him one more voyage under one condition. He would no longer be permitted to govern Hispaniola, and he was not to even stop there unless he needed supplies. Columbus called this journey, his fourth and final, the High Voyage. It was his last chance to prove himself and fulfill his promise. His one and only goal was to find a passageway to Asia. Columbus set sail this time with four ships and 144 men, including his brother Bartholomew and his 14-year-old son Ferdinand. Columbus stopped at several islands on his way westward and then landed on the coast of Honduras in Central America. From there he explored the coasts of Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, seeking the waterway that would restore his name. At the narrowest part of the Isthmus of Panama, he heard stories about a large body of water that was just a few days' march across the mountains. But he failed to follow this lead, and in so doing, missed yet another opportunity, this time to be the first European to see the Pacific Ocean. Columbus then backtracked 65 miles, where he founded the village of Santa Maria de Belén. It was the first European settlement on the American continents. Then, exhausted and suffering from the deliriums of malaria, Columbus prepared to sail for home. The final journey home was a hard one. His ships had been damaged by wood-eating worms and shellfish, and one had to be scrapped. The others, leaking badly, had to be beached in Jamaica while Columbus decided what to do. When one of his men volunteered to paddle a canoe to Hispaniola for help, Columbus gave his approval. In Hispaniola, officials refused to help Columbus until more ships could arrive from Spain. There was little more Columbus could do. His crews lacked the tools necessary to repair the ships, so they had no choice but to wait, marooned in Jamaica, until help was sent. Columbus and his 116 surviving crew members were stranded in Jamaica for one year. Finally, in June 1504, a ship was sent from Hispaniola and Columbus began his last sea voyage, home to Spain. He set out without having found gold or riches, without having found a waterway to the east, without having ever seen China, Japan, or the Indies, without having fulfilled his long promise to his monarchs and to himself. When Columbus arrived in Spain, there were no welcomes, no banquets, no royal summons. Queen Isabella died just a few weeks after his return, and Columbus wasn't even invited to the funeral. He hoped, however, that the Queen had remembered him in her will, and had restored his governorship of the West Indies. It was not to be. Hurt and in despair, Columbus retired to Seville. He was financially comfortable. His rewards for his voyages had been ample. But he was plagued by arthritis, and soon he was almost crippled by gout. He wrote repeated letters to King Ferdinand, demanding back his title as Viceroy of the Spanish Indies, but the king never responded. The tragic mishandling of the colony of Hispaniola was not to be forgotten. A year after his return, Columbus, feeble and in pain from his gout, traveled by mule to the royal court outside Madrid and sought an audience with the king. King Ferdinand greeted him warmly, but once again denied his request to be made viceroy. As the court moved from palace to palace in Spain, Columbus followed along, begging for his title and begging to be sent on another voyage. Over and over he was refused. In his last days, Columbus returned to his country house. His condition worsened, and he died on May 21, 1506, at the age of 54. With his last breath, he reportedly repeated the last words of Christ, into thy hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. His remains were transported some years later to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, where they were interred in a cathedral. Christopher Columbus was a man whose sensational voyages on the sea were matched only by the voyages of his own imagination. He died still believing he had sailed west and discovered the outlying areas of Asia. In his journals and his letters back to Spain during his journeys, there are repeated statements like, from here it is but ten days to the Ganges River, or we are but a few days from the court of the Mongols, or beyond this island is the coast of China. 
He was a man dedicated to his vision and beliefs. But that very dedication, which led him to great achievements, also prevented him from seeing the truth. Had he known the truth, he would have spared himself the deep disappointment and frustration that destroyed his last years of life. The truth was, he didn't reach the Indies, and he didn't find a passageway to the East. But the truth also was, he discovered the West Indies. He was the discoverer of South America. He established the first permanent settlement in the New World. He established the first European settlement in America. He led the way out of centuries of ignorance about what lay beyond the Atlantic, about the size of the Atlantic Ocean, and the size of the world. And he established the first links between two great civilizations, Europe and the Americas. What fueled him was a desire for honor, fame, and wealth. What disgraced him was his own cruelty and prejudice. But in spite of his flaws, and in spite of his own delusions about what he had accomplished, he nevertheless changed the course of history. He was a man who fully believed he had made great contributions, and yet he never really knew what those contributions were.